Welcome to the podcast series at the College of Education and Integrative Studies. I'm Jeff Pass, Dean of the College, and I'm here with royalty from the Interdisciplinary General Education Program, uh, Drs. Uh, Peg Lampier and uh, Roseanne Welch. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And uh, to, to start off, just for those people who don't know, what is Interdisciplinary General Education? You've been doing it longer than me. You go for it. Um, interdisciplinary general education is a program in the college designed to cover students' GEs or general education credits, but in an interdisciplinary way. And the way I used to describe that when we did um, orientations was it's a little bit like there's you can get you can get a, a salad with uh, some of this and some of this and some of this and some of this, or you can ball it all up in a bowl together and you can eat the whole thing and you get all the all the nutrients in that bowl all mixed together, and that's what we do in GE. So any given class, we'll be doing some history, some speech comm, some art, some li English literature, some writing, some... That's what we do, and we do that in a series and cover kids' humanities GEs. And it tastes better that way. It tastes way <laughs> better that better. way. And they really like the, the, the two primary rules of IGE, which are we don't lecture. Um, and we don't test. So the classes are really integrative and they're, Cal Poly talks a lot about learn by doing, but if you walk down the halls in most classes, somebody's lecturing with the PowerPoint on in an IGE, we don't do that. Nobody in the program, nobody in the department does that. The kids read things, we talk about them. The kids read things, we make a poster. The kids read things, we do a skit. There's a billion things you can do. And so they're in charge of their learning, which they really like. Right. And that is also part of our polytechnic identity mm -hmm. for students to engage in that kind of thinking and interdisciplinary work. Yeah, and I, would, I think probably this college of education is better at it than a lot of colleges of education in the country. Right. Well, uh, part of the reason that I refer to you as royalty, uh, I, I don't think uh, you would mind my mentioning that your evaluations are uh, as fine as anybody's in the university, or at least I've seen in my career. And, uh, but we're not here to talk about your teaching, although we could probably come back and have a 30-minute session on instruction. But we want to talk about your scholarship. Uh, you. You, you uh, individually and collectively are the authors of several books, which are all over this the table. File. Uh, uh, so you're very, very productive but also um, getting into areas that aren't usually addressed in mainstream kind of college uh, textbooks. Uh, so we'll start off with the uh, Women in American History uh, book, which is a Social, Political, and Cultural Encyclopedia and Document Collection. How did this piece of work come about? Um, because when I uh, was put into sharing a, an office with Peg, she had an idea about that lucky doing. Day. <laughs> You're so cute. She had an idea about doing um, a supplemental reader for a women's history course, which would take twenty important women and do sort of mini chapters on them. And I thought that was a really great idea, and I wanted to work on it. And I had years earlier published an encyclopedia of women in aviation and space with ABC Clio, which is a big education publisher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, let's send this proposal to them, you know, and see if they're interested. And we uh, ran into an editor named Michael Millman. Oh, Michael. Such a lovely man. Mm -hmm. And he and we never met him. It's all through, you know, online yeah. and through the phone. And he said, this isn't exactly what we publish, but I'm in the process of creating this four volume encyclopedia set. And they need a couple of editors for it. Would you be interested in that project? And um, and what did we say, Roseanne? Well, Peggy originally <laughs> said, I don't know if I could do that. And I said, I've never we done an do encyclopedia that. before. Yeah, but Roseanne's like, Roseanne's the queen of it can be done, and and I'm the queen of well, I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but you did it the polytechnic way, which is learn by doing. Yeah, absolutely, and we and that's. I think one of the reasons I took the project is I thought, I don't know how to do that. And it's fun to do something that requires you to learn a bunch of new stuff because that's a very different kind of work. You're not writing a book. You're, you're curating a bunch of people who are writing things for you. And you're mostly dealing with academics, which I'm sure you can attest is a little bit like herding cats. <laughs> so... Um, it was, it, and it's a, ma a massive endeavor in learning how to organize materials and. Well, because it's a million words. 
<sighs> and um, what we thought was most important to us, obviously, is women's history, duh. But we wanted to make sure it was inclusive in every way we could. So we had to seek out, we had to create the list of who would be included. Um, and so we tried to make sure we had women from all cultures, all ethnic backgrounds, all religious backgrounds, who hadn't been covered in the And well, in different kinds of doing things. Like yes. the kind of women who end up in these things tend to be sort of the ladies that were in the movement or something. So what about the ladies who invented something or, or the ladies who were famous for crime or the pirate or, or there, we add we have a gentleman here at, uh, in our IG department who studies burlesque and he was like women who ran burlesque companies were running full businesses they were they running theater the businesses yeah. exactly and why don't they get any credit for being entrepreneurs and for what they provided and we're like thank you you write a few you tell you're, us who the major you're women in. are yeah <laughs> so we were using other people's um research to have them give them a chance to highlight so that students will stumble upon this and then if they like that particular entry one assumes they'll go off and then study that person more in a larger volume. Right. As a, a textbook author myself, I recall being assigned to teach the usual women. Yeah. Uh, and that would be Rosa Parks and... Eleanor Roosevelt, Abigail right. Adams. You, you're naming them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, we're familiar. But this, you were trying to do something different. So students or anybody who reads this book what would be what would they come away with about uh, American history and in uh, women in American history? A couple of things. Um, one is it's a, it's history and popular culture, which I think is interesting. And that's more my background. Peg's the Civil War historian, and I'm more the popular culture historian. And so it was interesting to me in the course of doing this. Kinky Boots uh, was a Tony winner, and Cindy Lauper, who most people think of as just a pop singer, mm -hmm. uh, had written the entire musical, and she was the first woman to win a Tony for having written a musical without a male partner. Oh. So that gave her a reason to be in the book. Normally you wouldn't have necessarily thought about her when you go to a book like this. You're thinking of Abigail Adams and Rosa Parks. So it was great to be able to include people who have an influence through popular culture. And then this is different because ABC Clio's signature is that there are primary documents. Mm -hmm. So let's hear from these women in their own words. And in our previous research in our other areas, we both got to bring in again, primary documents that had previously not been published so that they weren't the same. Here's Abigail Adams mm -hmm. saying, remember the ladies. Here's this sort of thing. My favorite primary document is I have, uh, there's a collection in the volume with World War II, there's a collection of recipes from a woman's, a cookbook written by a woman about sort of how you cook during wartime with limited stuff available. And, and I thought, this, I'm getting recipes in a history book. How fun is that? But they're history. But, but I think also four volumes, one million words. I think even in 2010, we're really bad at the notion that American women did important things in history. Not just important because they're the ladies or the first lady to do that, but that, you know, 72 billion guys did it first. But that, that women make a, a serious and considered a contribution to American history, and just because you don't know it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And so this and a billion other things like that are supposed to address that. I don't know if they really do, because I think the people who are not paying attention to women probably aren't reading the encyclopedia. Yeah, but, but yet enough people are. But the attempt are. must be made, yeah. yes. And the fact that you're using primary documents, that's uh, been a revolution in the field yeah. of history. And people often think of primary documents as boring treatises and but you're looking at it as diary mm -hmm. entries. Letters. And, and for, me, for me, the favorite thing is when I was studying Civil War history in Natchez, Mississippi, I came upon divorce papers from a young woman pre-Civil War. And her, it, her problem was that her husband, who was only 17 and she was 16, um, had been found with one of the enslaved women on the plantation. But as opposed to what we know is more often the story, sadly, which was it was a situation of rape, this gentleman had fallen in love with this other woman, and he was insisting to his family, if you sell her, I will shoot myself. So he and the woman, the enslaved woman, ran away. And this woman was filing for divorce because her husband had left her for an African-American woman. And I thought, who is ever going to see a piece like that, except I found it in some dusty file in you know, a courthouse in, in Mississippi. So, And that's never been published anywhere. So just to see those different histories. And Cookbooks are a history because women's families survived because they figured out how to make a cake without eggs. Mm -hmm. You know, that's crazy to me. The kind of food that you got a ration book for and you had to decide 
how to make that work for a family of six back in the day. Yeah, well, it, it, getting... it kind of opens a window into the culture at the time in a way that you couldn't get it from just traditional textbook. Uh, also, the notion that domestic work, by which I don't mean just the dusting and vacuum, but all that stuff we do at home, that you go to work in your suit, but then you go home and you also have things you do here at home, that that stuff is an important part of American life. And we traditionally only imagine that public life is important. This notion that private life and domestic life is important is super key in telling the story, I think, of just regular Americans, regardless of their gender. Great. So... Uh, this Women in American History, it's uh, this four volumes, you say, and uh, you've had uh, contributors from all over the country. Yeah, all over the country, all over our campus, which was lovely. We um, used a lot of Cal Poly people. Mm -hmm. We did. And, and then we made a lot of online friends with people all over the place. Right. And the, the inclusiveness is why, I'm always happy to say, it came up from the American Library Association as the best resource of 2018 mm -hmm. and the best um, historical, historical materials, material which are which Michael Millman, our editor, said was like winning the Oscars for encyclopedias. Yeah, they're the ruses. <laughs> it was I, he was more excited. I was like, okay, that's cool, but he was over the moon, and that let us know that it was a bigger deal than. But that's, one would think. that is quite an achievement, uh, yeah. as much as you want to make fun of yourselves. <laughs> but how much work was it? I mean, it must have oh, been God. hours and hours. I think my husband almost left me. <laughs> Because that's all I did for a while. Because we, couple of years. the first encyclopedia, the second encyclopedia, we were better at it and we moved through it more quickly. But I, I obsessively, we, she, everything, somebody wrote it and then I'd edit it and then she'd edit it. So everything was seen by both of us. We didn't split it up. We each looked at, edited every single thing and that, and, and, and then you have to keep track of the, every morning you'd start with the, okay, who needs an email saying, your stuff is late. Right. And who do you say, okay, you're never going to get it to me, and now I have to reassign it. And you're constantly keeping every day, check the list, what's been written, what hasn't been written, every day. And what changes are coming up in someone's life that suddenly now we now have Now we either... have to manage that. Yeah, right. you like we had a contributor that got very, she had cancer, and we didn't want to say, well, you're out, but then you had to help manage the encyclopedia while she managed her life. And so you, you're juggling those balls. It was, it was arduous. And what did you learn about yourselves as a process of doing this? I learned that there's no way I could have done this without Roseanne, <laughs> which sounds completely cheesy. It's adorable. But um, I've worked with other people and the world's full of people who, and academia is full of people who talk a lot of writing but don't actually do it. Um, you need somebody with a, with, with a work ethic. Book, book writing isn't about inspiration. It's not about sitting around in a, in a, poet, a fluffy shirt. It's, it's, it's ditch digging. It's just hard work. And you need, if you're going to do a big project like that, you need a work ethic. And if you're going to do it with somebody, you need somebody who shares your work ethic. Mm -hmm. And so we work really well together because we both, we both know how to give up fun for work. <laughs> but the work was fun. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm going to say that I learned that for a while everyone would say you're always working because I'd be home at night working until 11 o'clock at night at this. And even my mother would be like, you're always working when I called you. You're in the middle of something. Whereas Peg is really good at knowing how to do these other things. She can quilt. She can make cheese. She does all this fascinating stuff. And then I realized I don't have my hobby is weaving words together. And if I get paid to do it on the side, yay. But I don't like that's what I want to do. So I, it's, not a, it's not like I'm always working. It's that I'm always playing with words. So this book was from 2010, you said? 2018. Oh, 2018. I yeah. think earlier no. you said 2010. No, you said 2010 back. Did I really? Yeah. yeah. I'm a liar. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So is this the your most recent work? No, the no. one under it is the technical encyclopedia. The technical that. innovation in American history. And this isn't just about women. No. No, what's really cool about that is we finished this one and we won the first of the three awards. And our editor said... We have this project that somebody started, blew the budget on, and didn't do any work on. Do you guys want it? Uh, <laughs> can like, you finish it for us, please? <laughs> and, 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 and I was like, no, I never want to do this again. I have encyclopedia, encyclopedia post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> um, but then he sent us the headword list. And, and the headword list is the, here's the entries for the encyclopedia. That the other person had decided on. There were no women in it. Oh, my gosh. No. And the other <laughs> editor was a woman. There were no women in it, and there were no, like, domestic technologies. So all this stuff about rockets, but nothing about vacuum cleaners. Um, and I th 
we, we now we have to do it yes. because we can't have an encyclopedia out there another one of those with just dudes and then you tell the story of the cover all right well it's partially one i also thought it was important to have a technical encyclopedia written by women because people would notice that but in terms of the pictures on the cover they had already paid for pictures and the pictures were to be benjamin franklin and thomas edison and in the middle was the space shuttle and we said that doesn't tell girls that they will be part of this book. Could we please have a female scientist? And this is Maria Mitchell, the astronomer. And at first they said no. No, they said no a bunch of times. Pictures. Yes, they already paid Many for Many emails they had, were sent. And we were stuck. And so we kind of huffed and puffed and thought, well, we'll just put in a lot of pictures of women inside or do something. And then we won the second award for the first encyclopedia. And we said, if we don't I ask right now, away, yeah. we will never, this is our best shot. And so we sent another email that said, this is our last shot. You've got to change this how, picture. How about a reward? Yeah. And how so, about yeah. a reward for the Rusa? And did, do either of you have a background in technical inventions? One of innovation? my subspecialties is the history of science. And my, I was in college. I was a microbiology major and a, and a chem minor before I turned to the dark side of the humanities. <laughs> so, so I do. But and and I like Star Trek. <laughs> but also, I don't think this is about understanding science. It's about how to understand. How do you make a head word list? How do you manage writers? And how do you edit words? And it doesn't matter when you're an editor. It doesn't matter what the content is. You need to know where the commas go and how what a paragraph structure is what and good that kind of thing. Is. And and in that sense, once you've edited an encyclopedia, you can do any topic. But. But I think knowing just basic stuff helped us make a better head word list. And the cool thing was we, at that time, were both teaching a class <gasps> that is Visions of Science and Technology for IGE. That's the best part of the story. And because we knew we'd need, we didn't have a budget to pay a lot of writers as we, we did had, the yeah, first Yeah, no week, money. Uh, because the other editor had blown it. We both thought, well, here's a perfect job for students to have their first publication credit. And so we made one of our assignments that they were assigned a certain number of entries and they had to write them instead of a research paper or some Instead of the project. final paper, they wrote encyclopedia entries and then we'd pace them through it. So on, this was back in quarter, so week six, your first draft is due and then we'd peer edit them and then you'd have a final draft due and then even when they got them then. So it was a heavier editing thing for us because yeah. you had undergraduate writing, which can, which some of it is really good. My daughter wrote a number of entries, which were better than some of the entries I've gotten from PhDs. It, but, but, but some of them not so much. But kids who were excited and well-intentioned and you wanted to have the, the publishing credit. credit. So if you look in the back of that for the authors, about two-thirds of the authors for that encyclopedia, their affiliation is Cal Poly. As it, it, was, it was our students. And uh, we should mention that uh, interdisciplinary general education is not a major. No. So you attract students from across the campus. Oh, yeah. And thus, some of them were engineers, some of them mm -hmm. were architects. Exactly. And early on, when we had a big headword list with a lot of stuff, you could pass around the list and say, Ev everybody pick something, and then pass everybody pick something again. So early on, they could pick things that seemed interesting to them. And then as we got down to the end, it was kind of like, this is what we have left, this is what you have to write. But early on, it, one of the cool things we could do is students could write things that they seemed super excited about. Well, what were some of the topics that uh, were surprisingly interesting or uh, you came upon something that you hadn't expected? I laughed at the fact that I would assume kids who use computers these days are well-versed in the names of the various, mostly men, who invented them. And you'd get a kid who'd pick Paul Allen or someone like that, and they'd be like, who's this? No idea. They'd be like, you use material he created every day as this core of your life, and you've never heard of him because he's the quiet partner, right? Or that sort of thing. Wozniak, mm -hmm. who, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, my kid who's into computer, knew and, and a student who took Wozniak's name was like, I'd never heard of him. So Wozniak, just for uh, the casual listener, uh, was uh, Steve Jobs' partner, and uh, Paul Allen was with Bill Gates. Exactly. Mm -hmm. these right. guys, so these are the more, and they weren't silent partners, but the other two got the big focus. And so it killed me that these kids had no idea who they were. But we also got, we also, and I like the entries that were like a dentry for the woman who invented the dishwasher. Um, and, 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 and we had a, and I had an entry on the blender and we had an entry on um, um, Tupperware. And mm -hmm. the, I thought those were really fun. And, and the, the stuff that you could learn about that. And um, 
whenever I do, when we teach 320, we'd have this sort of list of important people that you should know in science. And I'd always have this woman who invented the dishwasher. And I'd say, well, how, you know, you know, how come you know Eli Whitney? <laughs> you don't use <laughs> cotton gin. <laughs> but, but you don't know this lady. And, it, and not that I expect you to remember her name, but maybe the next time you touch a, a dishwasher or a blender or a toaster, you might think, I wonder if a lady invented this. And so that was, I like that. Timing about... was perfect. The hidden figures had just come out. So we were able to include Katherine Johnson, who hadn't made it into any of these kinds of books because who knew she existed? Right. But thanks to the book and then the movie, it was like, oh, let's go. And she just passed away recently. So it was so cool to think we're adding her into this mix of names kids will find as normal inventors and people important in the science industry. Mm -hmm. Has technical innovation changed over the years? Uh, I've heard that uh, you're less likely to have a single inventor nowadays. I think, yeah, I think there, if certainly like that first in the first of the industrial revolution, you have all these like, like industrial, like cowboys almost there that, you know, people working in their basements or their garages or whatever the equivalent of is in the 19th century, but inventing stuff. I mean, the lady that invented the apple core did it in her kitchen because she's like, well, I need to peel all these apples. Um, and I think now this that stuff is primarily corporate, and the patents are held by companies, mm -hmm. not by individuals. Exactly. And and th when there was a real, there was a real. F even you go back like the first volume. I swear, the first volume, the first section, half the entries are Ben Franklin things. Yeah, because that guy <laughs> invented everything. But but you know he deserves to be on the cover. There okay. there was a day too when you could be you could be you could do a lot of stuff. It wasn't just I got an engineering degree and now I invent stuff. It you could be everybody was doing it. They didn't write have a box for scientist or engineer, so it was something kind of anyone could do. And now because most of our academic world is not interdisciplinary and you have all these disciplinary boxes and then we go out into the world still living in these disciplinary boxes that changes who innovates and who gets credit for innovation too. And do you use these books in your teaching? We assign students when they're doing research and things like that, that they should go look for them. And sometimes students are so cute. They'll come in and they've Googled teachers before they take their classes and they'll know you have a book in the library. And I went and looked at it or, you know, sometimes it might, it takes longer. Like my aviation encyclopedia is actually 20 years old, but I've had students who come in and tell me that was on a shelf in their high school and they read because they had to research some woman like Sally Ride or something. And I'm like, wow, so it's still, people are still stumbling on names that I decided they should know. I will say I use the women's encyclopedia at Mount Sac in my women's history class because I don't like textbooks. And I never liked them even when I was a not, I because interdisciplinary general education kind of turns you into a weirdo <laughs> in the most pleasant kind of way. But because because what we do is still in 2020 fairly non-traditional, I and mean, we're not lecturing, and we don't use a te we don't use textbooks very much. And but I was never very fond of textbooks, and you can't assign a big, heavy, boring, expensive textbook over at a junior college and realistically expect them to read it. And I wouldn't read Why? it either. You can't afford it. Well, and I wouldn't read it. It's boring. <laughs> um, and so what I do there is I have, I have each week, I have a selection of readings from the encyclopedia. And they're short. They get to the point. The students, they'll, they, it's maybe 10 pages of reading a week. And you know they're of quality. Because yes, they're high quality. And they've, they've learned something because it turns out that's, while students won't remember the, an entire chapter about colonial American women, they will remember Anne Hibbins or the witchcraft trials. They'll remember vignettes because we're conditioned to remember stories. Teaching should be about students actually learning stuff, not just us all pretending and then them regurgitating and memorizing. And I think by using excerpts of the encyclopedia, I think they're, I'm, they're actually learning something, usable stuff they can take away from with, with them. And because we tried to be so inclusive, kids see themselves, right. they can find themselves and representations of themselves, and that ties them to the knowledge. Which is something they may not have gotten in their K-12 right. education. Yeah. Exactly. And one of the things we did in that book, and reviewers really liked it, is we didn't hide pe women's sexuality. So if a woman was not heterosexual, sexual, we said so. And historically what you do in these things is you just pretend not to. Let's everybody pretend that Eleanor Roosevelt only liked dudes. Um, and, and we didn't do that. I mean, we didn't out women who didn't want to be outed because that would be terrible. But that I've had students come up to me and say, I've never read about a lesbian before. And well, that's just sad. Yeah. 
So what uh, projects are you working on now? <laughs> in April, we have uh, another with ABC Clio. Uh, after the Encyclopedia of Innovation, they invited us to do uh, two books in a series called Hollywood History, where we look at films from sections of history and decide how close they were to the real facts. Fact-checking Hollywood was so, the original title exactly. of the series. It's and not anymore. because she's an expert on the Civil War, the first one we just finished is Films of the Civil War. And the one we're working on now is Women's History in Film. So in April, the Civil War one. The Civil out. War ones, yeah. Just got the email. It's, it's in the mail, essentially. And so it's very exciting. So many people view the cinematic version as the official version. Yeah. How do you uh, upset that way of thinking? I, re I know I really, when I first started out, I wanted to be all, well, this movie's just inaccurate. But the reality is, like, Steven Spielberg was making, in, with Lincoln, in the 2012 Lincoln, he was making a cinematic movie. And, and I really struggle with how do you hold a filmmaker who's, make, who's telling a story? How do we hold, is it the filmmaker's fault Americans confuse that with a documentary about Lincoln? <laughs> so, so I tried early on to be fairly gentle about that kind of thing. Um, because it's not a, a it's not a movie makers unless you're making a documentary it's not your job to get everything right because it's important to tell a story that's that she did a chapter on the Free State of Jones which is really historic, historically accurate movie it's also turgid and slow and about half impossible to watch it never ends because there was so much to tell and it was because he went into reconstruction which most movies don't do and he tells some really important facts that people haven't learned about reconstruction and black suffrage and all of that, but it's just like, oh. is this movie over yet? But it's not good storytelling. Correct, yeah. and that's a pity, because yeah. it's information people need, but it wasn't delivered well, whereas the Lincoln movie is better. There are some other choices we made that are pretty good. Gettysburg is really accurate when it comes to how the battle went. Precisely. But <laughs> it emits a bunch of people, and what she discovered, which most academics do agree with, is the best Civil War film, the most closely accurate, is Glory. The Denzel it's Washington. Wi it's widely exactly. considered the best Civil War movie. And Hands down. There, Oddly, they forgot who? To Harriet Tubman. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, um, and, and, and then, the, I'm going to say, oddly, the second best, most accurate and still a good story was Ted Turner's Andersonville, which had every excuse not to be, because Ted Turner was also the producer on Gettysburg, which is, which is the lost cause, oh, Robert E. Lee was so gallant business, <laughs> um, which I find really gross. Um, but but Andersonville, which is about the the, the prison camp, so it's a Confederate prison camp holding Union soldiers. It was actually a fairly accurate movie, and a pretty good story. So I started out watching that, thinking I don't even want I don't even want to look at this thing, <laughs> and then it turned out pretty good. And then Ang Lee's Ride with the Devil is moderately horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> because it embraces this sort of the black Confederate business, and then and you've got these uh, these bushwhackers in Missouri, these guys who end up being you know the James Gang and the Younger Gang and the Quantrill guys, just just urban ter rural terrorists, but it but it lionizes them as is heroic, is heroic. He makes them heroes. And, and their okay. cause is heroic, and they're fighting to ensure slavery, which mm -hmm. I think we can agree is not heroic. <laughs> um, yeah. But but but. White supremacist, sort of neo-Confederate websites love Ride with the Devil. They love it. So their, their notions, that you can look at best movie lists and you can literally tell somebody's politics. Mm -hmm. As the left likes glory and the right likes Ride with the Devil. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Yeah. So this will be very interesting. It's the kind of companion people can have as they're watching these films mm -hmm. oh. and consult uh, the experts. Exactly. That's what we, you, literally, it has a section where you explain what the film is in case the person doesn't know. Then you explain really what happened, and then you talk about how close the film got, what it let out, what it didn't, and all that. So it's kind of a nice analysis. And we took the work. project telling the editors we weren't very tolerant with, we're not going to, I'm not, we're not going to pander any of this lost cause stuff, or the Confederates were misunderstood, or slavery wasn't that bad. We weren't going to pander to any of that. So we don't pull a ton of punches in the book, which is going to be upsetting for some people. And I, I don't know, but I'm sure you can live with that as well as I can. Yeah. And, and the truth is, the reason you write books or write anything is because you have an opinion that you're trying to share with other people. Right. And the purpose of art is to get people to be thinking and discussing. Yeah. And that, if that happens, that's a healthy thing for our society that, won't, that will have a dose of skepticism whenever they confront some kind of artistic piece. And that's, that's quite true. a contribution. That's our goal. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing. I, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, the viewers will be interested in looking, o looking over these books and, and learning more. And uh, certainly uh, anybody who's thinking about possibly enrolling in the Interdisciplinary General Education Program, uh, this is what it's they all about. They should. And, 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 and take any of the instructors. They're all equally delightful. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.